Well, I decided to spare no expense but to bring one of my finer musical instruments with me from Indiana. This is an Oster 530C model. If you uh, try to play one of these at home, you want to do that with the uh, tr crumb tray down. It's better acoustically, but you can read more about that in Toaster Player magazine. This is an old song I learned years ago. I need your help with it this morning. When I point to you, I want you to say, Yeah, toast. Yeah, toast. Come on. You guys are pros. This is called Toast. It goes like this. All around the country and coast. People always say, what do you like most? I don't want to brag. I don't want to boast. I always tell them, I like toast. Yeah, toast. Yeah, toast. I get up every morning about 6 a.m. Have a little jelly, have a little jam. Take a piece of bread, put it in the slot. Push down a lever and the wires get hot. I make toast. Yeah, toast. Yeah, toast. Now there's no secret to toasting perfection. There's a dial on the side and you make your selection. Push to the dark or the light, and then if it pops too soon, press it down again and make toast. Yeah, toast. Yeah, toast. For many years now, I've been a booster of the browning of the bread inside a toaster. If it gets dark, I start hollering. Because don't you know I'm black toast intolerant? Yeah, toast. Oh, we mojo bonjour cordet. Oh, croissant et chevy corvette. Maurice Chevalier et Fiatar. Oh, we Maurice bon get bon soir. French toast. French toast. Yeah, toast. Yeah, toast. Yeah, toast. by now some of you are saying what was the spiritual significance of that there wasn't any uh, just so we're all on the same page I travel the country uh, doing ridiculous songs you can already tell uh, but also getting to share my testimony what God's done in my life and what I see him doing in all the places that I get to travel um, this morning uh, it's hard for me to believe but January 17th of 2004 I for the first time became a dad believe that yeah Yep, the government finally granted me permission to, to reproduce, and uh, my wife said we should hurry up before they revoke the license, and so she wanted a little girl, you know, uh, she grew up with brothers and never had a sister, so she really wanted a little girl. We would have taken either one, but on the very first try, God blessed us with a little girl that we named Brooklyn, like the city in New York. Then in the summer of 2005, we had our second child, another little girl that we named Katie, after a family friend. Then, just like clockwork, summer of 2007, we had our third child, another girl. And we named the third one Adrian, like in those old Rocky movies. And um, now with three girls in my household, 16 and under, I am in the midst of my 20 year stay on Planet Estrogen. <laughs> it's a wonderful place. I love being a dad to daughters. We thought we were done, but God had other plans. Summer of 2009, we had our fourth annual baby. And this time, we actually had a little boy. Yeah. We named him Jude, like the New Testament book, or the Beatles song, from whichever way you look at it. It's only two places I've ever heard that name. Guys, today, be grateful for the person you're sitting with, people in front of you, back of you, both sides, your, your parents grandparents, your loved ones, your church family. Every single day is so different and we're never guaranteed anything. February the 2nd of 2018, two years ago, my son came home from school. He was eight years old. Just like every Friday, jumped off the bus, come running up the sidewalk, excited. He loves the weekends because he didn't have to go to school. and He likes sports. And this was Super Bowl weekend. 
And he could not wait to watch the Eagles beat the Patriots, so he was excited. <laughs> calm down, calm down. That was at 4.30. And by 8 o'clock that night, my son had about 15 or 20 wires and tubes attached to him. He was in a medically induced coma. He was paralyzed. And they were putting him on a helicopter, airlifting him to Peyton Manning Hospital there in, in Indianapolis. He had contracted some rare strand of bacterial tracheitis that literally only affects one in four million children. But when it does, it's oftentimes fatal. First 48 hours or so, they wouldn't tell us anything. We kept asking, is he going to be okay? Is he going to open his eyes again? If he does, is he going to be the same boy? Sunday morning, my, my wife had gone home to be with our girls. I woke up with him there in the hospital Sunday morning and went to pick up my phone to, to call my wife. And I was taken back by messages from almost 200 churches all over the world. It's funny how fast Facebook can make stories travel. Churches in Nairobi, Kenya, London, England, all saying the same things. We stopped our services today to pray for your son. We're praying for Jude. <clears throat> I don't think I've ever seen prayer behave the way it did, like in that situation. You see, as those prayers kept rolling in around Tuesday or Wednesday, as fast as my little man went down, he started to fight back. I kept hearing nurses in the hallway. When I check his charts again, this can't be right. This is impossible. I sat in there thinking, lady, I don't serve the God of the possible or the impossible. I serve the God of all things. Ten days later, they decided they would try to take the tube out and see what was going to happen. Fifteen minutes after they pulled that tube, my son opened his eyes for the first time in two weeks. And as soon as he did, I knew who was in there. He opened his eyes a little bit and squinted. He looked around the room and found me, and he said, Hey, Dad, who won the Super Bowl? <laughs> God is good all the time. And church, I got to say this because I was convicted of it while I was in there with him. Even if it had gone the other way and my son hadn't made it, he would be with Jesus right now and God would still be good. I don't do serious songs. Um, I play a toaster. But I have shared this song in every church gathering that I have met with for the past 16 years after I first laid eyes on my oldest daughter. This song's about dads and daughters. It's about parents and kids. But it's also about the only thing that could be more important, which is how and where we spend our eternity. This song is called Forever, and it goes like this. You should have seen her dressed like her mother, heels and beats. Down to her knees Click now I have it This Kodak moment I've got to get copies made Now I know of This secret love That only goes daddy to daughter and try as I will, I can't make time stand still. I trade rich for poor. If she could be for forever. Who gives this woman? Reception begins, but it hasn't set in. I just 
gave my girl away. Her bedroom is bare. It doesn't seem fair. I've traded my child for some pictures. I'd give my whole world for that little girl to dance through my door. I wish she were four. Forever. When flowers have died around my graveside, you'll know that I've gone to the Father. My daughter will be soon there with me, but we'll be transformed to children of form. I'd like to watch moms on that song. I like that better than his toast song. <laughs> I did. Is it good to be in God's house this morning? Yeah, we have such reason for great joy. If you have ever said anything to this effect, yes, Jesus, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. Then you should have a joy like Peter said, even though we don't see Jesus now. We believe in him and love him, and we are filled with a joy that we can't even express because we know we're receiving the goal of our faith, salvation for our souls. Hallelujah. It is good to be in this place. The word says wherever two or more are gathered, he's in our midst, and I know he's in this place this morning. And so this morning, how many of you guys have heard the phrase, pay it forward? Most of us have heard that, used that phrase. It was based on an initiative. They made a movie about it, but it really did happen. There was a junior high class that was challenged by their social studies teacher on a Sunday morning, or on a Friday afternoon, I'm sorry, it said, this weekend your homework is to go home and come up with an idea that would serve the world and make it a better place. So as you can imagine, on Monday morning, as students began showing up, rolling out blueprints for robots and setting up environmental presentations and things like this, but one young man walked to the front of the class and just picked up a piece of chalk, went to the board and wrote the word me, and he circled it. He said, this is me. Then he took that same chalk and he drew three lines, just three smaller circles above himself. And he said, these are three people that I am going to serve. And the only thing I'm going to ask in return is that each one of them pay it forward by serving three others. Now, for the sake of numbers and my inability to do any kind of difficult math, let's say there's 100 people here right now. Okay, let's just say we've got 100 folks. If every single one of us went out into our communities, our workplaces, our schools, our neighborhoods tomorrow and served three people in need, 
immediately 300 lives would be touched, right? Now, if those folks, those 300, paid it forward one time, 900 lives would be changed by the fact that we decided to serve others. The second time, now you got almost 3,000, 2,700 lives would be different. That's a community college. And if you do the math on this, by about the eighth or ninth time that that kindness gets paid forward, literally millions of lives begin to change. All when we do what we are called to do in Scripture anyway, and that's to simply serve. I'm in a different church every Sunday morning almost, um, and I... Too often, I'll get there early, and the same thing happens. It happens a ton. Thank you very much for that. It happens a ton. I'll get there early, and one of the longstanding congregants, one of the elder statesmen or sacred cows of the church will will approach me, and too often, they say the same thing. They'll come up to me, and they'll say, Tony, our church wasn't really growing none. We weren't serving nobody, weren't telling nobody about Jesus, so uh, we fired our preacher. He's gone. He weren't no good. The whole time I hear these stories, all I can think to say is, brother, if you ain't serving nobody, if you're not telling anybody about Jesus, I mean, you, maybe you should run yourself off, not the guy down front. It's up to every single one of us as individuals to advance the message of Christ, not just by the stuff we say, but by the way that we love and serve on this world that so des- desperately needs it. We were called to serve, make no mistake. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, Jesus, in fact, assembles a team of guys, 12 guys. He gets these guys together. And I, I was driving up the highway today, and I saw the new uh, Raiders, the Las Vegas Raiders uh, stadium that they're building down there. I kind of picture this a little bit like a football scene. Jesus is out in the middle of the field. He calls out to his guys. He says, my 12, my dream team, let's bring it in. We're going to huddle up right here. I'm going to get everybody's hand to huddle. I'm going to talk about our game plan, our strategy, all right? So everybody bring it in. Peter, put the fish down and get over here. I'm trying to do something, all right? Matthew, get in here. We got everybody? 7, 8, 9, 10. Where's Thomas? There he is. All right, good. Guys, listen very carefully. This is our first plan, our first play we're going to run. This is our game plan. Are you guys listening? Okay. I want you guys. Go. And you got a picture of the disciples with their hands in the huddle going, Go where? Wait, time out, Jesus. I don't think you understand. I quit my job. I left my wife and kids behind to follow you on this grand mission. And now you're just telling me to go? I mean, that's it? Jesus says, yeah. See, I want you guys to go and serve people in need. I want you to lay hands on lepers. I want you to tell people of the grace that God has shown you. Fellas, freely every one of you has received. Freely you ought to give. So go and serve someone and do something. Go. And Jesus modeled that game plan all the way to the cross of Calvary for every one of us. We were called to serve, not to sit. We were called to serve. Years ago, there was a young man growing up in Southern California. His name was Larry Walters. Larry Walters, you want to write this name down or at least make a mental note, because after I tell you the story, you're going to go, nah, he's a comedian. He made that up. That can't be true. Larry Walters, young man, early 70s, Southern California. He had one ambition in life, one dream as a, as a child. Larry, more than anything else, wanted to be an airplane pilot. He wanted to fly planes. The only problem is Larry was born with horrendous eyesight. You've heard the expression, blind in one eye, can't see out of the other. Larry was almost legally blind in his left eye from birth. And despite being a pretty good student, you know, he he applied to the Air Force Academy. They rejected his application. Went around as a young man of 18, 19, even 21 years old just to get a local license so he could dust crops or do something in a plane. But everywhere he went, the response was the same. Larry, you're blind as a bat. Ain't nobody in the right mind fixing to put you in a cockpit of a plane, son. Frustrated by this, Larry paced back and forth at work. He worked for a film company in Los Angeles. And as he paced and tried trying to realize his dream, trying to figure out how could I do this, Larry spotted in the back corner of the warehouse some weather balloons. 
and a teeny tiny halfway burned out light bulb went off over Larry's head. And Larry said to himself, I have me a fine idea. He gathered up the balloons and took them home, tied the balloons to a lawn chair, tied the lawn chair to his Jeep, filled up the balloons, went in the house, got a couple of sandwiches and sodas and a handgun. Larry went back out, got in the chair. His girlfriend came out, and she was actually the one that cut the ropes, and Larry Waters took off. He began to fly. True story. He was first spotted by, by a pilot. Could you imagine being on that plane? You're flying into L.A. with your friend, you know, looking out the window going, hey, Pacific Ocean is beautiful. Down there's the Staples Center. We should go to a Lakers game. And there's a guy in a lawn chair. Larry was just sitting there eating a sandwich. 3,000 feet in the air. Right there where planes come in and out of the, the, the airport there at Long Beach. That's where he encountered airplanes and pilots that were spotting this guy and reporting him. And eventually, after this whole thing was all over, Larry was uh, reported, had, had, had quoted, you know, they put a quote in a newspaper where Larry said, it was getting kind of dark, so I thought I should come down. He starts shooting balloons. And Larry went down about as fast as he had gone up. Now, fortunately for him, he actually, right before he hit the ground, he, he, he crashed into some power lines. And it suspended him and prevented him from hitting the ground, hurting himself, maybe even you know, losing his life. He was, <laughs> he was fine. He didn't have one scratch on him. Knocked out 41 blocks of electricity in L.A. that day. But he didn't have a scratch on him. Got out of the chair. Every news crew in town, as you can imagine, they all descended on the scene. They all wanted to get this guy's story. Everybody wanted to interview the lunatic in a lawn chair. That's what they called him. And as they pieced together his story, at the end of this, one reporter had enough. He said, you know what, Larry? I, I hear this against all odds Hollywood story you're giving us. You wanted to blind, you know, you're blind, wanted to fly, nobody would let you. I understand all that, but Larry, I, I got to ask you, Really? I mean, really, a lawn chair, balloons, and a gun. Why would you do something so crazy? And Larry Waters responded very profoundly like this, and I quote, I figured I can't just sit there. That's all I had to say about that. <laughs> that was his entire rationale behind pulling this insane stunt. Well, I can't just sit there. And as crazy as it would be to see one of you this afternoon floating over Las Vegas in a lawn chair with a bunch of balloons attached to you, let me challenge every person in this room, myself included, what would happen if everyone in this room, every single one of us, adopted that same mentality as a Christ follower, as a Christian? I can't just sit here. I can't. This corner of the U.S. would be flipped upside down for Jesus. That's what would happen. We are called to serve. John 21, there's a great story. If you've ever spent much time in church, you've probably heard this a bunch of times. Even if you haven't, maybe you've heard this story. But Jesus is having a conversation with his friend Peter. Now, Peter was one of the 12. He'd been with Jesus three and a half years. They ate together, went fishing, built campfires, sang songs. They did life together. Jesus and Peter walked on the water together. Peter saw Jesus do stuff all the time. He couldn't even explain and eventually, Peter watched Jesus die on a cross. He saw him take his dead body off that tree, place it in a tomb, and he watched a bunch of soldiers roll a huge stone in front of it. But a few days later, as the story goes, Peter saw a stone rolled away. He went inside and experienced an empty tomb. And here in John 21, he is sitting face to face with this Jesus who had beaten death, who had conquered the grave. And Jesus says three words to Peter that completely changed the rest of Peter's life. Now, don't ask young kids about this. I asked a bunch of first grade boys a year or so ago, what were three of the last words Jesus said to his friend Peter? So one little boy goes, eat your spinach. No, those must have been the last three words Jesus said to Popeye. But Jesus and Peter having this conversation, and at some point, as Jesus would typically do, 
he completely takes the conversation in a totally different direction. They're talking, they're talking to Jesus. Hey, Peter, do you love me? <laughs> what? <laughs> of course I love you, Jesus. Yeah, but Peter, do you love me? Lord, you just asked me that question like 10 seconds ago. You know I love you. I love you very much. And the word of God tells us that Jesus asked Peter a third time. Peter, do you truly love me more than these? Now, Peter knew Jesus' style, knew he was getting at something. He may have even been hurt by this line of reasoning, like, where are we going with this? Lord, you know all things. You have to know that I love you. You've asked me three times now. I've told you three times. Just imagine Jesus looking at Peter and saying, Peter, if I ask you a hundred times, You'll say it a hundred times. Saying and living is two different things. Then the word of God tells us, Jesus said to Peter, Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep, Peter. You say you love me. You're here. You're singing the songs. You're praying with us. That's great. It is. But man, if you love me, feed my sheep. I was born in August 1968. That's right, I'm 77 years old. <laughs> and the moment I was born, I was placed immediately into an orphanage out in western Maryland. My birth mother couldn't take care of me. She, she knew it. Her family wouldn't help her. So that's how I started my life, as an uncared for orphan. But while that was taking place, a 17-year-old girl, a teenager, wrote her husband-to-be a letter. See, they had just gotten engaged, and a week later, he got drafted into the U.S. Army and went off to serve in Vietnam. She wrote him a letter, and she said, I am praying for you every day. I wake up, I pray, I pray at night, I, I pray all day long that wherever you're at, you're safe. I pray this war will end so all of you guys can come home. But every day when I've been praying, God's been laying on my heart this calling, this desire to be a mom. I really think that's why God put me on this earth. I'm supposed to be a mommy. And when I pray, I don't think God wants me to wait till you get back, we get married and have kids. I think God wants me to be a mom right now. That G.I. got that letter, and he read it, and he said, <laughs> Say what? Wish I could have seen his face. But then he prayed about it, and he wrote her back. He said, you could find a child who has no one. Who has nothing. We'll take him in, and we will raise him together as our own. So she started looking. During the process, he got back. They got married. And a short time after that, they walked into the room where I was being kept. Walked right up to my crib. They picked me. Truthfully, my mom a few years ago told me, we went in there to find a little girl. I said, Mom, you missed it by a long shot. She said, well, I heard your voice. You're in that crib laughing and carrying on. <laughs> Imagine that. She said, all I could think when I saw you was, I don't know anything about this child. It's not my blood. I, I don't even know what his name is. But I know this little boy needs a mommy. So she picked me up out of that crib. And along with her 21-year-old husband, they took me home. And for the next 18 years, all right, for the next 40 years, <laughs> anytime I needed anything, 
I always had it. Roof over my head, clothes on my back, shoes on my feet. Got to play baseball and go to school. I was taken to church even when I didn't want to go. I was that age. That was the first time I ever heard anything about Jesus or God. It was when my mom would take me to church. There's not one single day that goes by in my life where I don't thank God for her and what she decided to do for me. You guys know what James 127 says? Don't worry, no one else does either. James 127 is a verse we don't talk about in church. I don't know why. James 127 says this. Religion that God accepts as pure and faultless is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and don't be polluted by the world. That's what it says. Acceptable religion to God, and some translations say acceptable worship to God, is looking after those in need. I love that verse. A few years ago, my heart was captured by the voice of a child. His name was John. I'd gone to Ethiopia. Started going on missions trips about 10 years ago. A friend of mine called me up and said, hey, want to go on a missions trip to El Salvador? I said, yeah. Went home and Googled El Salvador. <laughs> I could have been going to China. No clue where I was going. Got down there and got off that plane. That first trip, I realized something. I know this isn't popular to say anymore. I don't care. We're fortunate we live here. We're fortunate we're Americans. We are. This place isn't perfect. Let's not kid ourselves. No place is. For the past 10 years, I've traveled the world and gotten off planes in so many different countries and thought, wow, I had no idea. I went to Ethiopia. I fell in love with the Ethiopian people, their culture. They're just beautiful people, so joyous even in the midst of a poverty that, frankly, does not exist in this country. Not even close. And these people would dance and sing. I went to their church services. Oh, they don't have anything, right? They have each other, and they have their God. <laughs> One of the first things you think about when you go to a country that's far away for a couple weeks is, man, what am I going to eat while I'm there? We went to the first day I got off the plane. We went to meet and find out what we were going to be doing. And we went to this project, and right beside it, there was a pizza place. I thought, pizza in Ethiopia? I peeked in the window. It looked great. I thought, well, if nothing else, I can come back here. Went inside. And the trip leader said, today we are going to Project 512. We are going to a worship service at the chapel with the children. Then we're going to see them get their education. After we leave the classrooms, we are going next door to have lunch at a pizza place. I thought, wait, there's, a, there's one out there too? We drove 10 minutes to get to this place. I counted seven or eight more of these pizza places. I went to our trip leader. I said, I don't want to offend you, but I, I didn't connect Ethiopia with pizza. Like, what's that all about? He wasn't trying to be funny. He says, oh, yes, Ethiopia is the one African country that has never been ruled from the outside. Years ago, Mussolini comes to rule us. <laughs> but we drive him back and defeat his army. But we keep his food. We like it. <laughs> so, man, I had spaghetti, lasagna, pizza. It was great. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I laughed so much on that trip. So many of the Ethiopian people were just like that. So funny. So full of joy. The last day, next, right before we left, I... <laughs> We went and we visited this orphanage, and all the kids were outside playing football. It was soccer. They call soccer football. Got out there. I'm watching the game, and this one little boy, John, he kept coming over to me. Give me five. All right, there you go. He told me his name. He wanted to know my name. We're talking back and forth. He starts laughing at me. He thought I was funny looking because <laughs> never mind. And eventually, he came over to me towards the end of the game, and he said something very strange. He came over, and he said, Mr. Tony, after football, I want you to come meet my mama. I said, all right, John. After football, we're going to go meet mama. 
ran back out on the field. I thought, wait, th- this is an orphanage. Like, I don't understand. Game ended. He came over, and one of his coaches came over and said, oh, yeah, John lives right down here. He walked down a path, not even a tenth of a mile. He came up on this little, really, it was a bamboo and a lot of greenery, like a, like a Gilligan's Island, like one of those little huts. Went inside, and I got to meet Mama. And I wasn't there five minutes before I realized exactly what was going on. She made us coffee. They have coffee ceremony before you do anything in Ethiopia. It's right there with the beans, grinding them up and stuff. It was amazing. She started talking. She said, when John was a baby, his dad went to work one day, and there was an accident, and he never came home. I've done the best I could for the last eight or nine years with my boy. But now the doctors tell me I'm in two different forms of stage four cancer, and they don't give me a whole lot of time. But she said two years ago, this project intervened in my son's life. They came to us and said, there was a young couple newly married in Huntsville, Alabama, who wants to sponsor your son. Since that time, he's gone to school. He's learning how to work on cars. He gets to play football, and he brings home water and food, even medicine for me. They value me as his caregiver until I'm not here anymore. Six months ago, my son brought home Jesus Christ, and I can never repay it. His sponsors had told him about Jesus in letters. And eventually he made, John made Jesus Lord of his life, came home and told his mama. And she said, I'll never forget this. The last thing she said to me, she said, now because of our great God and two of his faithful servants in America, I know that no matter when I leave this place, my boy will never be an orphan. Church. We are not saved by the things we do. Only by the grace of God and blood of Jesus Christ do any of us have hope. Without that, we would be lost. But Jesus himself said in Matthew 25, one day all of us will leave this place. We'll have our last day on this earth. Every one of us will stand before him. And on that judgment day, Jesus said, just like my mom heard my voice and like I heard John's, every one of us is going to hear the voice of God. And Jesus said, I'll already tell you what he's going to say to you. What did you do for the least of my brothers and sisters? Because I tell you, whatever you did for them, that, that's what you did for me. What will we say, church? I think about that all the time. What will I say? I want you to meet somebody. This is Veronica. Veronica is a real five-year-old little girl who lives in the Philippines. She's much bigger in real life. My birth mother couldn't take care of me, but you know what? I was not a mistake. I was not a mistake. And neither is she. Today, when we leave this place, right down around the corner, I got a table with about 15 or 20 of these boys and girls there. They could use your help. It's a very simple thing to do. You go out. The hard part is picking one. They're all going to look at you. I'll just warn you. You pick one out. You open it up, and there's a little card inside. This little card takes about 30 seconds to fill out. But that would change Veronica's life for eternity. What happens after I fill it out? You hand the card in. This is the only card on earth for Veronica. She's not on the internet. She's not out at some other church. I'm the only one carrying her around right now. So these kids are out there. They're all the same. This is the only place that they can get sponsorship is today, this morning. So you fill it out. You hand in the card. And then you would essentially be sending Veronica here just over a dollar a day, a dollar and a couple pennies. We're talking about a small Coke at McDonald's, 
just kind of personify this. And so at a church a year ago, this lady down front goes, I get my drinks from Starbucks. I said, well, you could help 10 of these kids then. <laughs> it is perspective. Guys, my wife came to me 10 years ago, and we took our first. She was from the Philippines. My wife said, Tony, you think we could cancel a pizza night once a month so a child could survive and know Christ? Where do our wives get this stuff? <laughs> of course we can do that. I know not everybody can do this, but I know a lot of us today could probably take a couple. Go out there, go to the table, and uh, church, this is a tangible way to change the kingdom. All right? Um, I also want to tell you that uh, there are opportunities to serve right here at the Springs Church. Two opportunities left, only two. I'm kidding. <laughs> There's unlimited opportunity to serve right here in the ministries of this church. So maybe today the Spirit's moving on your heart to sponsor a little girl. Maybe it's moving on your heart to come and say, hey, Pastor, you know what? I have not been involved as I need to be. Plug me in. How can I help? And still there are some of us here today that maybe have never made Jesus Lord of our lives. I want to tell you today, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And he asks you to come today. You know, cast your burdens on me because I care for you, he says. So today you come forward. There's people all around you in this room that would love to tell you how much it's meant to their lives to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I guarantee if you made that decision today, the very angels in heaven would rejoice with you. So I'm going to pray for you guys. Thank you so much for allowing me to come and share my heart. My, this isn't a, a sermon, a message. It's not a sales pitch. I don't work for Children International. I don't work for Compassion or any of them. But I will wave their flags so I'm not here anymore because I have been there and I have seen this and it is real. Almost 90% of every dollar goes to the direct benefit of this child when you sponsor. That's unheard of in the nonprofit world. God gives me 100 years on this earth. I'll be standing here. You can mark your calendars. I'll be preaching again year 2068. And I'll start off and say, open your Bibles to... I don't remember... But then, more than being a voice to be a comedian or a singer or anything like that, I will be a voice for those that do not have one. Let's pray. Father God, you are good all the time. You bless us, Father. You're so good to us, not because we have houses or bank accounts or some of the things that some of these folks might lack. Our resources don't make us blessed, Father. Our resources make us responsible. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you were willing to part with your only son, your only child, to come and die for people like us so that we might be adopted into your family. You are good. Lord, um, I just pray that you'll move by your spirit in this room today. Convict us, Lord, whether we need to come to know your son. Maybe we need to serve him more in, in any capacity. Uh, just move us in this place today. We pray all of this in the name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I believe that Jesus is worth living for because he believed I was worth dying for. Can we thank uh, Tony? Amen. Wow. Mm, that's so good. Boy, that's so good. Can I ask the, uh, the altar team to come up? Let's take a minute. Uh, if you just bow your head, look, you might feel like an orphan. You might even feel abandoned, um, alone. I know I did one day. And I was orphaned. And someone gave me an opportunity to render my life, surrender it to Jesus Christ. So I'm going to take that moment. And if you will, just repeat after me. Father, I confess I'm a sinner. And I confess I need you in my heart. Lord, please forgive me of my sins. And Lord, live in my heart. Father, I want to be yours. And Lord, I know you will be mine. And Lord, I believe that you died on the cross. 
And you, you were buried. Three days later, you rose. And you were seated at the right hand of the Father. Father, come in me and take over my life. I surrender to you. Now, if that was you, welcome to the family of God. You are no longer an orphan, alone, by yourself. But you are now in a family. Welcome to the family of the kingdom.